this new guy, Benji, is going to sit in on the news. And me, we had such a well-oiled operation. Well, Howard and Robin and me and Fred. And it was a perfect show. And everybody loved it. There was no room for improvement. There really wasn't. So all of a sudden, they put this guy. <clears throat> I, have, I had no space at all. And all of a sudden, I got this little chubby kid sitting next to me. And he's writing, too. Meanwhile, I'm writing jokes. But I'm reading what I'm writing and what Fred's writing, deciding what to put up for Howard. So now I have to decide between me and Fred and what Benji's writing which is slows the process, you know, so I don't, you know, it just made it crazier. But I don't fault Benji because I scraped and clawed to get where I got. So I don't know whether he scraped and clawed to get there, <clears throat> but it was an annoyance, but it wasn't his fault at all. And that had nothing to do. I think that was Howard's agent's way of saying, look at this, we got somebody who can step right in and replace you. Uh, nobody ever said that, but I knew better because you know, writing jokes was part of my thing, but leading the ball breaking and getting my balls broke myself and instigating and my good laugh. You know, I, I added a lot more to the show than just my notes, which were a major thing. And there was no animosity between me and Benji. That had nothing to do with anything, you know. So uh, right away, and people, you know, people are looking for stuff, you know, like, oh, it's great. You and Artie finally are talking again. I'm like, what are you talking about? I left in. I left in March, and Artie didn't come on the show till like October. There was no crossover whatsoever, and I was friends with the guys that they, a lot of the guys that they put in my seat to replace me. You know, there was no it was it was I asked for more money from my from my boss, and they said no, so I went home with my football. It, that's not enough for people, but that's in essence what happened. You know. Yeah. Well. I always always say, you know, there's a Jackie era, there's an Artie era, and then there's what they're doing now. So I would call you and Artie's tied for first, and what they're doing now. I don't have you listened. Do you? I mean, it, it's just so not what I know. He's older, and the things change. No, I I don't talk. I mean, I've never listened to one second of it. But I I, I don't know if I told you the last time I spoke to you, but uh, I get ridiculous. I get fan mails from kids that weren't even born. When I left the show, which is kind of hard to wrap your head around. <clears throat> but at one point, I got a fan fan email. I, I probably told you this already because it was it's still my favorite. <clears throat> he said, Jackie, I'm 28 years old, something like that. And I live in Toronto. And I discovered the Howard Stern show in 2007, you know, long after I left. And he said it immediately became my favorite show. He says, but then... I found out about the old shows that were on from the 90s that were on YouTube and different places. And he said it's like having a new favorite band <laughs> and finding out that their early albums were much better. I was like, whoa, you know, I couldn't even craft that kind of compliment for myself. You know, it's like I love the show, but it's not it's a, just a shell of its former self, which is, you know, and, and that's <clears throat> it's not fair to say that's a consensus. Because that's the consensus of people that tell me. You know what I mean? Whether that's 1% of the people or 90% of the people, I'll never know. But uh, for the most part, and in people's imaginations, the show gets better and better the longer time. You know, people talk about the Channel 9 show we did like it was the, you know, like it was the epitome of television for the world. And you go back, some of the shows <laughs> downright unwatchable. It was so horrible. It is true. But it was so much fun because we had no budget. Yeah. You know, you know, it was like it was like uh, we did a radio show that was like, uh, who was that guy? That did, uh, like uh, Ed Wood. It was an Ed Wood radio show. You know, <laughs> nothing to work with. You know. Well, Channel Nine shows how I got to hear you guys and see you guys, and I thought, what is this shit? I need more of it. And then the E Show came. <laughs> um, and it's funny you said that because I started watching a <clears throat> bunch of just old stuff from your era. And I think the side characters were great that you had versus, you know, you had a Grillo and a, you even you even got a little bit of KC, but uh, Ganji would come in and you guys were just un, unrelenting. Of course, Gary. Um, did you ever work with Beetlejuice? Did you get a chance to, to have him? And uh, did you ever write for Beetlejuice? <laughs> I've met... He was, on, <laughs> he was on many times before I left. Um, there wasn't a time he walked in where I wasn't, like, Ski like you, you think you're ready for what you're going to see and you're just not. Um, but I, you know, th that was, 
that wasn't the show. That wasn't me and Fred being really witty and funny and quick and Howard Riffin. And, you know, that that was a freak show. Yeah. You know, and the fact that he was <clears throat> so, so challenged. And so, I mean, I'm not a I'm not, you know, Mr. Sensitive, but it was though what was funny about him was that he was a circus freak. Yeah. You know, and, and you, you know, you know, you ask him to recite the Declaration of Independence. Anything he says is going to be funny, you know. But after that, I wasn't around for when they started booking him at events, and I don't know if they took him to strip shows or whatever they did. You know, you know, I just, you know, you know, Beetlejuice spell the word red, and he'd say zebra. You know what I mean? He was a moron. You know, <laughs> nothing against him. It's not, <laughs> not his fault. You know, I love him. Uh, Scott the Engineer. He's a guy who's been cast off. Do you get a chance to talk to him? You guys trade some stories at all now that he's been uh, let go the way he was? No, no. I, I mean. <clears throat> I'm not really, uh, I'm not out of contact. We don't, we don't talk or anything, but uh, he was going to come to see my show down in uh, the Palm Beach Kennel Club last December, but he didn't, he didn't come, but maybe he'll come this year. I think he's got a new girlfriend and stuff. He was always a really good guy and, and he did a lot of favors for me and I did favors for him, you know, when we were on the show, but we weren't really close, you know, and I did plenty to break his balls because that was my job, but he, he liked that because the infamy helped him with his business. You know, it is. He was doing DJing at the time, or, you know, whatever it was. Well, know, talk was, about yeah, the E Show. He was a star. You know, you have the Push Up Challenge. You have him screaming at Ganji, just him going nuts at Ralph, or or that was. And then you guys would pop in and just completely it, that. It was the machine that you talked about. It it really was fun. Nancy Sirianni's in the movie. Uh, your wife, which is one of the top, you go if you go look at top ten moments of the show, read them off. It's always your apology, uh, <clears throat> which is way back in the day, uh, but it's pretty funny. Tell me, just having her on and uh, how you guys uh, talk and about that that day of the apology. I mean, just, just <laughs> she uh, uh, she is still. I mean, I saw her, you know a few hours. She was here. She lives two doors away. Her and her boyfriend and. Uh, her and her boyfriend are two of me and my girlfriend's closest, if not closest, friends. And, you know, we still love each other. She's wonderful. She was a friend long before we were lovers and married and stuff like that. <clears throat> She's so great. And uh, there's two complete chapters in my autobiography about that event. Because, you know, the whole thing was portrayed so unfairly to her. Because she had nothing to do with it aside from getting mad at her boyfriend or getting mad at her husband. You know, that whole thing. I don't know if you read the book, but we were scheduled to fly to Europe for two weeks. We're going on vacation, the show, and we're going to Europe for two weeks to see her sister get married in Paris. And then we're going to Venice. I mean, we hadn't been on a vacation like that ever. And we're supposed to leave. I think it was on a Friday. And I think that the funeral's on a Wednesday, something like that. And, you know, it, it happened so fast, the thing with Jessica, it was such a joke. I mean, me and Howard were in the bathtub with her for probably 20 seconds. And, uh, you know, we're sitting around getting drunk. We drove to Philadelphia, and we're in Howard's suite. And I know I'm drunk, and Billy doesn't drink, and, and Howard doesn't drink. But me and Gary and Fred we're, and John, we're having a great time. You know, we're, we're excited. We're going to have a big funeral to celebrate being number one. And Howard, out of the blue, calls up Jessica. And says, she, of course, was in the suite right next door. He said, Jessica, come on over and take a bath. And she said, okay. And so his suite was so big that it was down the hall of the bathtub. She's like, Howard, I'm in the bathtub. Come on down. And he's like, I can't go down there. My wife will kill me. And I said, well, I'll go. Because I figure I'm going to keep on my blue jeans and my underwear so there's no foul. So we go down there. Uh... It, you know, a lot more. It was really funny because the tub was all drawn. Jessica's there in her bathroom, and the tub is drawn, and we threw Stuttering John in the water. And then when we pulled him out, the water was so filthy that we had to empty the tub and refill it. It was hysterical. And uh, and then she got in the tub, and she said, come on. So I took off my shirt or whatever, and me and Howard got in with her. I think he had on his underpants. I not only had on my underpants, I had on my blue jeans. We got in the tub. And I'm not thinking anything of it. Well, when the when the mics opened up the next morning at six o'clock, I never I don't know if I ever went back and listened to it, but Howard made it sound 
Like it was a full scale orgy, like a, like unbelievable, like. And of course, my wife was not listening, but her friends were listening. So by the time it got Howard's version of the story related to Nancy by way of her friends, you know, I don't know what the hell she thought, but I just know I got off the air and she was on the phone and I never heard anybody so mad. At my, she was out of her mind just out of her mind, and I didn't know what to do. And I got home, and <clears throat> I thought she was going to kill me. And it was really funny because she got in the car and took off, and I went to open my suitcase, and Stuttering John had put Jessica's wet pink negligee in my suitcase, which which is a great, great stunt. But if I had opened that with her standing there, I'd be dead. You know, and I threw that thing away, <clears throat> and I called our therapist. We used to call it couple therapy. I don't think we were even doing it anymore. <clears throat> I told the situation, and Emily, our therapist, said, Jackie, you got to get Nancy on that plane. Do whatever you can to get her on that plane. Once you're in that plane and you're on your way to Europe, they'll just all melt away and you'll be off on your vacation. And that was her. And so in my mind, I'm like, what could I possibly do? <clears throat> and that's what I came up with. And next morning, the first thing I said, Howard, turn on the mic. And off the top of my head, I just did the most sincere apology. And I really meant it because <clears throat> I really didn't think I had done anything wrong. But, you know, we all know you what you think and what your girlfriend or your wife thinks. You know, everybody has a different interpretation. So I couldn't have been more sincere. But, of course, they played it like Nancy put a gun to my head and said, you better apologize on the radio. You know, so that was all malarkey. But meanwhile, we wound up getting on the plane and had the greatest vacation in the world. So, you know, of course, you would never know that from the show, but it had a really happy ending, and it was a really incredible... The funeral for DeBella is... It's so funny. <clears throat> Coincidentally, I think last Friday was John DeBella's last day on the air. I think he officially retired last Friday, which is how funny is that, you know? But... Uh, Still doing that, it. That, that's what happened. That's what happened. You mentioned Stuttering John. He's in the film. Uh, keep in touch with him. It seems like he's kind of gone off the deep end a little bit, maybe. <clears throat> oh, I, w- I was in touch with him, but I'm not really anymore. He, uh, yeah, he can get he can get pretty weird. I don't talk about it, but um, we were very good friends for a long time. You know, he he wanted to. Uh, his girlfriend wanted to move to Long Island. He said, "I'm only moving to Long Island if we can move to Bayville." So they came to Bayville and they lived here for a couple of years. And so me and Nancy and John and Susanna, we were very close. And uh, we had a lot, a lot of good times. And he's a good guy. He's smart. You know, he's a hustler. He's okay. But, you know, I don't quite agree with everything he does, but not many people agree with the things I do. So who am I to talk? Well, that's a good (laughs) point. I love when you tell me a Robin story. Uh, So any Robin stories that uh, come to mind, you two were so tight and so close and had so much fun as we wrap. The funniest thing uh, of late, uh, she actually took me to lunch uh, however many years ago, but uh, she was trying to get me to join that forum thing or whatever thing that she's in. I was like, Robin, I love you, and I, you know, I'll buy lunch, but the, I'm not joining any, uh, any wacka wacka doodle uh, you, know, you, know, you know, those groups, whatever, you know, you find your soul, and, you know, please, you know. You know, talk to people and be nice to people. That's all you got to do. But uh, <clears throat> I do Cameo.com, right? And I've done, I don't know, 500, 700 of them. And people yell at me. They say, you don't charge enough money. Because some people charge like 500 bucks. I don't know if you know what it is, but it's a thing where people pay money for you to do a little iPhone video for them. Like if, you, if your friend said, hey, it's Brad's birthday. Hey, Brad, happy birthday. And I'll tell a few dirty jokes and fool around. Maybe they'll give some inside information. I'll break your balls. And it's like two or three minutes. And I don't charge 75 bucks. And the fans of the show just, they eat it up. They love it. You know, they'll say, you know, they give me little snippets of things to say about this or somebody like this. Last week, a guy said it's my father's birthday and me and him, used to scream. My father's turning 85, and we used to scream when you read from Robin's book. I don't know if you know about that. He said, would you do that for him? And I said, you know what? That's the weirdest. And I looked at my computer, and I still had the pages I had scanned, because I'd actually taken a few pages and scanned them so they'd be easy to read on the air. 
and I went a little wild with it on his cameo. And the guy tipped me like a hundred bucks. He was over the moon. But I got to tell you the truth, man. I thoroughly enjoyed the. Oh, then we walked down the street, and my legs were so long, and my mini. Oh God, just, just hysterical fun. You know, yeah. it's it just it totally everything comes out of goofing. You know, we're in a limo going to a movie screening, and the movie screenings we used to go to were like a couple of blocks away. <clears throat> but Howard couldn't walk, so. Four, five, six of us would pile into the limo like Howard and Robin and me and Fred and maybe Gary, maybe, whatever. We're all jammed in there. And we're, of course, we're going a couple of blocks in midday in Midtown. So we're stuck in traffic. We're not going anywhere. And we're all like climbing the wall. And I had my bag, my canvas bag. And I looked down and Robin had just given me a copy of a book. And I just reached in and took it out and opened it at random. And started reading it in her voice, and they went bat crap. They went nuts. And, of course, then I did it on the air, you know, however many times before Howard realized I was getting too many laughs, and then we stopped doing that. But people loved it. It 